Rogers, Dundalk goalkeeper, Mees GA coach. I think you're a goalkeeping coach, and up until recently, PFAI chairman. Is that right? How are That's you? Right, yeah. Up, up until Friday, I'm finished on Friday officially. Finished on Friday officially. Um, how yeah. do you find that, by the way? Um, compared to like Stephen McGuinness is a secretary. Is that right? Yeah, Stephen's a general secretary. Yeah. Yeah, and what are the differences for people that may not know between both roles? Well, like Stephen is in charge of of the union day to day. Him, him and Ollie and Simone are in the office, and we have a new girl in there now, Emma Burrows, who's the player development manager. So they run all the league affairs on behalf of the players. Obviously, I am the chairperson, so I will head up the the players department, and we have, um, I suppose between myself and Stephen, we are in contact daily, um, and more than once a day at the minute, and has been for a good while, but. We would be in contact daily about issues regarding players, and we would filter in, say, all the needs for of players from all the clubs. So we have players delegates, um, which will which we would be in contact with, and then we also have a management committee, which is made up of players from uh, that are elected at the AGM. So the AGM is this Friday, so the lads will be doing that via Zoom, um, this year, and uh, there'll be a new board elected and and a new chairman, obviously, this year. How did you manage to juggle the roles together, the three roles? And I think you're a family man as well, isn't that right? That, that must be hard. Yeah, well, the, well, look, I've, I've two young kids and we've, yeah. a, we've a third on the way in the next in the next <laughs> eight weeks or so. So um, all going well. Look, it's been busy. You know, we're, there's been an awful lot has gone on um, in the league over the last number of years. And I was only looking through the stuff that we had, you know, since I've been chair, what has gone on between... You know, there's different things like with Bray and Limerick, and you know there was match fixing, and there was uh, um, obviously the fallout from the FEI stuff from last year, and we had the women's national team um, issues that they had, and and now on top of everything else, we've COVID nineteen, so that's been a real. Uh, it's been a busy, busy few years, you know. But uh, I decided I was going at the end of last year anyway, and I was just seeing out the term until until obviously until this week. So it was. Uh, it wasn't COVID nineteen that made me decide to step aside. But look, it's just time for somebody else to take on the role. Like I'm coming towards the end of my career, no matter how long I go on for it. I'm certainly in in, in the tail end of it. So uh, it's important that there's new players coming along and to take on that role and uh, for new blood to come into the management committee. Like I'm, I'm not obviously going to go away, but I certainly won't be playing a major role like I would have over the last number of years. You're you're a goalkeeper. Have you had another twenty years, haven't you? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the experience. How did you find the experience overall? Was it an eye opener being the chair, or I'd say it was. Was it? I looked. There's certain aspects of it that would be eye opening. You kind of see more the political side of what goes on between behind the scenes. Not so much in our own union, but in relation to the running of the league and. So like that. And I did my um, I did an online sports management degree through FIFA Pro, uh, which is an online degree. Uh, we do it in Aalborg, but it's it's through um, a university in Denmark, and um, it's for open for athletes all over Europe, not just soccer players. It could be rugby players or any any athletes that want to kind of do it in their I won't say their spare time because it's a full time degree, but it just it suits their schedule. So I did that on top of it. So it was kind of I probably look I would have seen. Um, all the ups and downs in relation to the league and what can happen and the, the need that we do have for for a union to represent the players because you know if you don't have that support from from, from a union and um, you know the stuff that can go on that you know you wouldn't you wouldn't really want it to go on in terms of players not getting paid their wages and and you know loads of different issues that, that that you may encounter and it's good to have the support of a union behind it that you're able to you know check with them to see if look is this the right procedure is this the right right way of doing business so it's very important and it has been very important for our players and that's why we have such high membership in 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 our league you know we, we've over three we think we've 300 members which is a very high percentage of the players are, are members of the union yeah i think the reason COVID problems have really showed the problems the issues that there are there in the league haven't they really in fairness like um no tv money 
um, general neglect and things like that. Players, you know, have a lot of players have only one year contracts. I think we've a bit of an issue at the moment in terms of finishing the league or how many games can be played. A lot of that's based on contracts being up in November, isn't it? Yeah, well, see, the, the issue you have with the contracts is that a lot of the contracts will say end of season. And that allows, generally allows for, say, you know, the week at the end of the season, if you're in the cup final or you're not, or if you have playoffs or not, it just depends. And so the end of season is really the last game of the season. But obviously, with with the situation we have now and the format um, of what the league is going to be hasn't been defined yet. There could be issues in relation to how long the league goes. But then again, you, you look at it, the other end. There's there's players at the minute who haven't been paid wages for two or three months as well. So, um, you know, there's issues all over the place and either end of, of the fixture schedule. So, um, that all that stuff all has to be ironed out, and that's what clubs are probably trashing out at the minute as we speak. And um, you know, they have had a package put to them in terms of finances to get the league back up and running. And the the, the general feeling from that last week was that clubs were were happy with how that has uh, come across, and it as opposed to what was given the previous week. And now, since that has developed, um, it looks like there will be spectators. So that's a kind of another factor that, that can be added in. So there is that uh, opportunity to generate extra revenue with, with um, you know, the allowance of supporters in the games, which is great because I think, you know, the games, you know, with, with supporters and without supporters are vastly different. And you can see it from looking at football on the telly. It's great to see football back, but it just highlights the importance of supporters. And, and in our league, supporters are, are everything, really, because you see how reliant clubs are on, on gate receipts. And, and it's, it's very evident right now in the situation that clubs find themselves. As a player now yourself, how would you find going back and playing just the 18 matches, which essentially is 13 games at the end of the day, is it? How would you find, I like my opinions, but what's your opinion on it yourself as a player? Um, look, it's not ideal and it's not what um, it's not what clubs and players, I suppose, signed up to at the start of the year. It, like, you know, regardless of your situation where you're top bottom in, in the, on the table, like you've signed up to a league campaign, which is 36 games. And now the goalposts have been moved considerably. Uh, and, and this is probably the fundamental problem that we're having at the minute with clubs. They, they don't know what road, route to go. Initially, it was thought that we would lose one round of games and um, that would leave it a 27 games, uh, 27 game season. Or, and, you know, that was the initial thought and they would extend the season by, by a month or so, uh, leaving into December. And now it looks as if some clubs, I won't say all clubs, I don't know, you don't know individually which clubs want it, but they want to finish the season now in October. So which you would leave very small time frame to finish the league. And now, like if you're if you're the bottom team and you've lost four or five games and you've got 13 games left to rescue your season, it's it's a difficult ask then for to get them to come back. But the one thing's for certain is football does have to return. Um and there's European football around the corner for four teams. And um, so they'll be very keen to get football back up and running and get some league action underway. And um, so it's vitally important for them teams um, you know, to get some sort of football back. I know there will be friendlies now allowed as well. So we're going to we're going to see action. And, you know, as a as a league, you need to have you need to have a domestic league in order in order to have a national team. That's a fact. And, you know, it's you know, up to the FEI to get the get the ball rolling, get football back up and running. Yeah, because you feel like time and the decision are starting to run out as well. That decision will have to be made yesterday, so to speak, wouldn't it? Like, it's really r- running out, isn't it? Yeah, it does seem like this, the, the thing is a lot of time. Like, we, we still haven't officially got a, a start date penciled in, and we're the only, we're the only year, um, summer league in Europe that hasn't got that in place. And the teams are, are starting to return to training now on the pitch. Um, but as of yet, there is no official date. You know, the 31st of, of July is what has been talked about, but it's not confirmed. And then you've also got the fact that there's no end date confirmed either. So uh, the, unfortunately, this league has the longest off season in Europe, uh, with the exception of Finland, and that's down to, down to snow and winter and whatever else. Um, so we're gonna have sh- it looks like if, club, if, if things go the way they're looking at the minute, we could have the, the shorter season as well. So... Um, there's a lot of issues there that need to be to need to be rectified. Um, like 18 games for me is not really enough for for a season. I think you know if you had three rounds would be better. Um, but it, it's hard to know what the best the best route would be. Like there certainly has to be promotion and relegation for me. Um, because you know it takes the integrity out of the game, and that was a point that was made at our our recent uh, committee, our delegates meeting. Whereas you have to have promotion and relegation in football, otherwise. 
you know, you, you'll end up with a lot of games that mean nothing and, and you know, nobody, they won't be supporters wanting to pay in and see them either. So, uh, and there may be other issues that arise from that as well. Yeah, you're essentially talking about coming back to play friendlies if that was the case. And it would be very unfair, particularly in the first division clubs, like what if they to play for if there's no promotion? Like at least in the Premier Division, I suppose, you'd still have your European race, wouldn't you? You'd have your whoever won the league. But I know you have to have a relegation promotion. It's very simple, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's even for teams that are going for the league, if you're going for the league and you've got to play a team who's struggling uh, to stay up, you know, there's that element. You, like a team that's, t- uh, I've been at both ends of the table, and when you're fighting for points, um, you know, to stay up and to guarantee survival, and, and in some cases, it could be guarantee your livelihood because going down could be the difference between being a professional full time footballer and then having to go back to part time with that club the following year. So, look, you, you're playing for your livelihood, and that's at stake. And, and you know, results can vary uh, at the end of the season where you have teams you know, who, who are fighting for that for survival. You look at the run that Finn Harris went on last year. They had a great run second half of the season. And you know, without that kind of um, edge of having promotion relegation, I think you lose that. And, and then them games become basically, you know, you could predict who's going to win them generally. Do you know? Yeah, I think another little issue there actually is the fact that like yourselves are obviously back. Tra- how are you back long back training now? A few weeks? Yeah, we've been back training uh, three weeks you know, or so and we, yeah. we've been tested and we the testing has stopped this yeah. week but we'd be tested um the three previous weeks weeks so yeah. um we've been back look we haven't stopped training it, it's just it, it's the way we trained has obviously varied and you know it's difficult for lads training on their own it's probably not so much for goalkeepers we're used to training in, in smaller numbers i suppose at times but um we've certainly been keeping fit and you can see by the lads and they come back in the train everyone is in good shape but now you need to get you need to get on the pitch and play games and, and get some matches under your belt. Would you sympathise a little bit with some of the clubs who aren't even back training yet that they're possibly at disadvantage? Just say we did get back on the twenty first of July. I know you're saying clubs are training as such, or players are training, but in terms of a collective coming together as a group, would you sympathise with those clubs a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's, it's you know, and even uh, as we speak, there's still not a, a date penciled in for, for when, you know, they're going to be back playing games. So, so it's a little bit like training for a marathon. You never know when they're going to spring that on you. Like, you know, if you're a runner and you're training for a marathon, you're going to know when that when the marathon is taking place and you'll try and peak to get yourself in as good a condition as you can in order to run it. So, like, it, it is difficult for everybody at the minute. The one thing, like, European football, we do know that that's going to take place 18th, 19th of, uh, of August. So, you know that is the firm goal at the minute for uh, obviously my teammates and the uh, the players in the top four, but like for everybody else in the league, like it, it's been very difficult for for players. And then you look at player situations, whether they're getting paid or not paid, and having to take wage cuts. And and everyone's got, you know, families and dependents, and you know it, it's difficult circumstances for everybody. Yeah, it's a messy scenario. Would you have sympathy for Niall Quinn and Gary Owens though? <laughs> Well, it is it is difficult. The one thing I would say is I've been disappointed in terms of the speed that the, you know it has taken to to make decisions. Um, but I do understand the situation that they've been left in. Um, I think it come down to you know the way the, to the way the FEI had been managed with the previous regime, and we all know, I suppose, the faults in in that. And you know you're coming into an association which is in serious debt and has serious issues. I think you know that I, I think I've mentioned it before. There was UEFA money came there in March or April of this year and they'd already drawn it down. And that money, if that money had been in place, I don't think you would see the time delays that we've seen in terms of getting football back up and running. Um, I think it's been delay after delay and there's been no real progress made over the last six weeks when we all knew that you know, football was starting in Germany. I don't know how many weeks ago now. And, you know, we still haven't got, we even haven't even made a decision. So, um, you know, that is vastly frustrating for, 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 for everybody with your, you know, a player in the league or a manager or a coach or, or, or people involved with clubs, it, it's it's usually um, disappointing that, you know, there's no firm, fig, uh, you know, start date in place and, you know, no roadmap, uh, you know, put out there so we can see what we're going to be doing for the next number of months. It's funny because I think you might have mentioned this somewhere as well, but we actually had a bit of an opportunity. If we came back first-ish, you know what I mean, that we could have taken advantage of that as a league as well. Say there was nothing else on. Now, I'm not sure how possible that was in reality. But could you imagine our league could come back before some of the other leagues came back? Suddenly, people maybe who wouldn't watch normally might go to a game or two or whatever, you know yourself? Yeah, there was certainly an opportunity mm. there, I think, if we were able to to um, capitalise on it in terms of getting mm. the testing in place and getting, you know, 
even if it, even if it had been the Jul- the July tournament that they were talking about, um, just to get football back up and running because I think we were crying out for sport and still are. Um, you know, our own sport like there's no GA, no rugby yet. Um, obviously, look, GA club, um, the GA clubs are back trying this evening. I think it is is their first day back and. But you're looking at, you know, they're going to be playing, Intercounty is going to be in October and club championship is going to be before that. And so there, w- there was an opportunity, I think, in order like, to get ourselves back up and running. But look, I suppose when you have all the different parties, you know, trying to, you know, negotiate and finances were, were a huge issue. And I think it, it all boils down to, you know, I suppose the way the finances were managed before. Um, and we, were, we didn't have that contingency fund there to get, you know, to boost the league and get it back up and running. If that had been in place, I think there may have been an opportunity to capitalise on, on the lack of sport and, you know, maybe to advertise our league to people who, who may not have tuned in previously. Yeah, 100%. Now, you're a St. Olsen's man, isn't that right? It is indeed. <laughs> so, um, you played a bit of football, GA, with St. Olsen's, and I think you went on to play, I, I remember you playing now, I can't remember the year, a couple of National League games at Mead anyway. How did you find that? Yeah, um, I obviously, loved GA yeah, as a club. yeah, no, I I would have played GA all the way up, um, and it would have been my preference as a young player. I would have played minor and I played junior and senior for Mead. So, um, yes, yeah, so it is my club. I can see it from the house here, and uh, um, yeah, in two thousand and two thousand and six or seven, I played a couple of games in the national league. I w- what happened was the year um, I was at Dublin City and Dublin. <laughs> Sorry, I did. Yeah, I you played your hair that time. <laughs> I was celebrating. I was celebrating at that time with highlights and everything, so I enjoyed it <laughs> while I had it. <laughs> but uh, I, I played. I did play a couple of games in the national league. I think it was around two thousand seven. But I, I, um, in between, I was kind of in between contracts between Dumb City going bus and joining Galway United. So I, I was playing with my club. Uh, we won a junior championship, and I was on the mid senior team. Kyle, Colin Coyle was the manager, and I played a couple of games. And the first two games in the national league, one as centre forward and one as a goalkeeper, because. Both goalkeepers were away. One was on honeymoon and one was on holiday. So Kyler asked me to play in goals. Um, so I had to play in goals in one of the games. But I was essentially, I was in there as, as a centre forward. So what made you move then to the soccer? Because you, you said yourself, was it just the professionalism of it, basically? I know you moved to Drogheda. Was it fairly soon after that? Is that right? Yeah, you know, it was actually, it was way before that. Like, I, I kind of, when I was... Yeah, when I was seventeen, eighteen, I was on the scene. I was on the senior panel. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was at Shelburne at the same time, and Shelburne would have been, you know, um, the the champions that time. And I was training with Shelburne. Like I was a young young goalkeeper, very raw, and I was playing training with Mead as well at the same time. And I actually got suspended with me uh, with me club in in a in a, in a, a Leinster club match. And I wasn't going to mention that, but there the did you mention it. All right, so. <laughs> When you get suspended, it wasn't you get one game. You used to get three months or a month or whatever it was. And I got three months for giving the referee some friendly advice that he didn't he didn't really like. So I ended up, uh, I got dropped off the Mead panel because you could, there was no point in, in, in training for three months and you weren't able to play. And I actually went on loan to St. Francis that time. So I got a kind of, I, I made me, me uh, League of Ireland debut. That was October 2000. So it's, it's a good while ago. And uh, I, played with, I played with them. In the in the first division, and then I, then I went to draw out after that. So I didn't really I didn't really play any Gaelic then for four or five years until two thousand and six when Dublin City went bust. So it was I, I was probably I was between you know Gaelic and soccer at that time, and and that kind of uh, incident with the referee basically steered me away from the GA for a while. Not because of that, but it just so happened that I, I ended up making me. De- yeah, well, I made my debut in the League of Ireland. And, like at that stage, you didn't know whether you were good enough or not. And um, like I wouldn't have played, you know, much soccer on the way on the way up. Like I would have been all kind of GA orientated where I'm from. And so you don't essentially you don't really know, you know, how good or bad you are. So um, I was thrown in the deep end by John Noonan at St Francis and played twenty games for them and moved to Drogheda and won the first division in Drogheda in two thousand one, two thousand two. So I kind of got off to a decent start. Yeah, you also remember the FAI Cup winning squad as well, weren't you? How'd you find yeah. that? In 2005, yeah. It was kind of a frustrating year for me because um, I had played with Drogheda for the previous four years and Paul came in and he signed Dan Connor and um, he brought Dan in and look, it was obvious that Dan was his his keeper and he wanted to play. He, he played Dan. Sam and Dan worked really well together. Still good friends with him and 
Like he would have got the better of me in, in, in terms of he got the manager's seal of approval and he went with Dan for the season and I moved on. But um, you know, I, I kind of turned it around in 2011, whereas with myself and Dan were in competition again and Pete Matt, Pete Matt and opted for me for the, for, the, for the year. And so, it, look, Dan Dan's a great fella and we work really well together. And, and that's that's the nature of goalkeeper. I think yeah. um, you've, always, you've always got good competition and, and when you're playing and you're not playing, you kind of have to wish... The other man well and, and you know we Seth and Dan still talk regularly to this day and we you know we've we've pushed each other on in 2005 and six and 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 the same as in past in 2011 and 12 I think it was yeah because I think when you're a goalkeeper as well isn't there a tendency maybe for a manager say the goalkeeper makes a mistake or two in a few games you don't just get dropped instantly usually you shouldn't really like you know so they usually stick with the goalkeeper so it's very hard if you're a second goalie isn't it to actually get in as such in those circumstances as well yeah, look, it is, and I think you know you, you can, keepers lose the form, save as same as anyone else, and, and that's the nature of the business. But like your manager will always give you one or two chances. Like I think if it's if it's a case of of multiple mistakes in a close proximity, I think you know yourself you're you're not going to be playing, and and it's a, it's a rootless business, and and if your form is not good, you can't expect it can't expect to be playing, and and your number your opposition is always going to be pushing hard to. to to get into the team so I think goalkeeping is mo- mostly about consistency if you can keep that consistency and keep the jersey and um, you know that that's you know that's half the battle yeah you moved to Galway then as well I think it was 2007 how did you find it out west I think you were there for two seasons is that right yeah two years it was um yeah it was kind of it was great facilities and ground and 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 they really enjoyed it down there like Terryland Park is a brilliant pitch, and we used to train in, in Salt Hill Devon. And the setup down there was excellent. And uh, it was Tony Cousins that signed me, and Jeff Kenny came in the second year. And we kind of we pulled off a bit of a miracle the second year where we stayed up. I think we were ten points away from safe, safety with ten or eleven games to go, and we we um, we took we actually we went on a we had a bit of a a meeting. We were a two day retreat basically where we kind of got all our issues out of the way. We had a kind of a business coach come in and talk to us and. We turned around our form, and I think in the last ten or eleven games of the season, you know, it would have been championship winning material in terms of the points. We, we yeah, we thought it up, and we stayed up in the last game of the season against UCD in um, in UCD. Uh, we had a visit from Michael D as well after the game, so it was kind of uh, it's one of those achievements that you know you don't get any medals for, but it, it certainly I think you, if you speak to any of the players that were in that group at that time, it was it was it, it's. It's an achievement that you won't forget, and, and you know when everyone is kind of expecting you to go down, and, and basically has you has you down. And um, it was great to turn it around and to to stay up on the last game of the season. It's almost a bigger achievement in a way because you feel like you're kind of saving the club in many senses because clubs go down to the first division and they could be there for a while. So, but if you win a league, you know obviously it's great to win the league. You have the medals and all that, but you're right, it's a little bit different. But did you feel that Galway that you like? Almost like a superhero. <laughs> well, I don't know about a superhero, but I, I can tell you that, that the lads, like that group, you know, that yeah. the, the way we were able to grind it out and and pull ourselves back in, um, like I, I can't remember the exact, you know, points we 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 thought it up, but we were at one stage. I remember going down to Cove, and Cove were second from bottom, and we got we got beaten by them, and we ended up being ten points behind them or something like that, uh, and we had we had three places to catch up, not just one. So it was um it was a great achievement, and and I think can can speak for probably most of the players in in the group at that time. Everyone was very proud of that achievement, and it probably means as much as as winning a league. Obviously, it's great to win a league, and there's there's, there's no denying that. And but it was in itself it was a great achievement as well. Yeah, you moved on to St. Patrick's Athletic after that, and I think was it Jeff? You left with Jeff as such, was it Jeff Canterbury? Yeah, Jeff. Jeff got the job in St. Pat's and um, I, I, I went there um, after, obviously after that, uh, that season where we stayed up in the last game. So I, I moved on to St. Pat's then and it was 2009 season. You had your first experience in Europe with Pat's, is that right? Yeah, it was. Um, they only spoke about it last week actually to Jamie Wall. I should say, wasn't it? At that stage, no, it was it? Jeff. It was oh, Jeff. Jeff actually, okay. Yeah. yeah, in 2009, we, we played in Europe yeah. against. We played Valletta from um, from Malta, uh, Krilia Sovietov from Russia, which we beat as well, and then Steaua Bucharest in the third round. So we had a, a great run in Europe that, team, that time, and, and you know, we beat a, a Russian Premier League team, which, you know, it takes a bit of doing so it was a it was a fantastic run and, and it was it was the highlight of that season because we would have had a difficult year 
in the league a difficult year myself but uh, before in Europe uh, thankfully it was good and we had great experiences that year now, obviously then you moved on to Sligo and you got your first taste of success. A lot of people probably think it's that long ago they thought your first title was with Dundalk, but it was actually with Sligo Rovers, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, 2012 and um, yeah. it was it was probably a long time coming. I was at the stage, um, I left St. Pat's that time in 2011. I think yeah. Pete and, and Giller had gone and um, Liam Buckley was coming in. I was out of contract. I was speaking to Liam and I was speaking to Paul Cook and, and Cookie convinced me to go down. And I just felt that it was Sligo the previous year, the finished runner-ups of Shamrock Rovers, and I really felt that they were as good as Shamrock Rovers, if not better. I, you know, look at the team they had, and you know, I just felt that it was a massive opportunity to go and win a league. And I seen the players that Cookie was signing. And he brought already signed Danny North and Mark Quigley and uh, Ron Bocco and Ross Gaynor and a few others and he, he signed Lee Lynch and stuff like that so he was assembling a really good squad and, and he was adding it to the squad that he already had so I just felt it was a great opportunity to win the league and at, at that stage of my career I was itching to win the league because I just felt I, like when am I ever going to get one <laughs> you know because I'm initially going to Pats hopeful that um you know you'd be able to win a league there and it just didn't develop like like that and and i just felt that sligo was a, was a great opportunity to do that ironically you'd be passed to win the league as well it's 3-2 i think at the showgrounds as well wasn't it do you remember much from that day yeah i, I remember half time going into it and, and everyone thought we were home and hose but it was a, it, it was a very different uh, scenario in the second half and we went back to two all and i think bisto had a shot then as well that hit the crossbar so it looked like you know we were going to go from two nil two nil up to um, you know to three two down. Having said that, I think we had a, we had a four point lead at that stage in the in the in in the league race. But you know we we uh, quickly tucked away the penalty and, and you know the rest is history. I don't think it was a penalty at the time. I think it was a bit dubious, but we got it anyway. And uh, yeah, we we won the league with two games to go. So it was a couple of games to go. I think actually Drotter might have finished second that year, but. That was that was the defining game, really. I suppose you know three games out, where Pats would have, if they had a beaten us, they would have had a chance, obviously, because we had to play drop game as well. So, but it was it was it was brilliant. I don't think we the, the last two games we did, we we lost the last two games this season um, against I think we Shamrock Rovers and dropped in the last two games. But like you said, the job was done against some Pats, and uh, that was it was a brilliant feeling. It was a great couple of weeks because I think the lads had been <laughs> celebrating for two weeks afterwards. I think it's the fact as well that it wasn't just obviously personal for you, your first league title, but the fact that Sligo at the time hadn't won it in so long as well, and to be part of that, um, as you said, the great players there, you named them all pretty much. I think one you missed set was Joseph Nadeau, who was a special player as well. But um, jo- jo- Joey was already there, you see. He was really ah, part right, of- you were talking about the signings, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. signings that, that he was adding to the likes of Joseph, yeah. he, had, he had Alan Keane, exactly. Gavin Pearce, yeah. J- Jason McGuinness and, and Danny Ventry. All these lads were already there. Um, and so you were just, you know, the new signings that Cookie was bringing in was just adding to the group that he already had. Now, we did lose Richie Ryan, and Richie's a terrific player. But, um, you know, the, the quality that was in the squad, um, you know, it was it was a great sign. And like you said, it was 35 years since Sligo had won the league. So, um, <clears throat> and, and Sligo is a great club to play for, um, you know, the whole town and, and county. And even you, know, you go into Leitrim and Donegal, Donegal and parts of Mayo. It's really well well supported down there. It's a proper club and, and it's a fantastic place to play. Oh, it's a good, I like the showgrounds as well myself, personally. Um, so you moved to Dundalk in 2015. How did that come about? Um, well, it was kind of, I, I suppose, we had, I had three good years in Sligo and I suppose Stephen you know, gave me the opportunity to join, join Dundalk. And Dundalk had, um, you know, obviously had been on the ups since Stephen took over in, in, 2000, in 2013 when he took over. Um, in 2012, Dundalk nearly got relegated and, and you know, were in, I suppose, serious financial shape, uh, or poor financial shape, should I say. And, um, like, you know, the job that Stephen did, you know, in order to make them com- really competitive in 2013, 14, and to build on it, you know, and, and, and won the league and the opportunity to join him and, and that group. Um, and obviously, I was moving closer to home as well, was one that, you know, I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't pass like it was um I was just delighted that Stephen thought enough of me um you know to bring me into the group that had already won the league and to feel that I could improve the team so like that's that in itself is a major confidence boost that you know the manager thinks that much of you that you're going to improve the team and and uh, so that was you know that was from the start that was great to kind of hear and and you know that to give you that belief going into the group 
I think that's interesting thing you just mentioned it there about Kenny because uh, a lot of people don't understand. They look at Dundalk now and say, look, they have a great squad and they're winning every year, whatever, like, you know. But they forget that Dundalk, as you say, I remember it well as well, we're in dire straits when Stephen took over. And the turnaround, I know you weren't there early on, but the turnaround was amazing, very, very quick. They'd won the title in 14, didn't they? Just so you joined a team of champions, isn't that right? Yeah. So it just shows um, the job he done was incredible to take them from that position, wasn't it? Yeah, it often gets forgotten, I suppose, because yeah. of the success of recent years. But you look at that group of players, like, and you remember that was a part-time team as well. Like, you know, well, a part-time in name. Like, the lads are training in the evenings, and 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 you know they made the training that they would do. And the same when I got there, we would have been training in the evenings because we had we had lads who were working like Dave McMillan and Dane Massey had jobs as well, and Andy Boyle and stuff like that. So it it, it went from part-time to a full-time club, and and. You know, a lot of the core group of players that Stephen would have signed, you know, are, are still are still there. You, you look at like the Dane Massey and Brian Gartland and Chris Shields and John Mountney and these guys, and even like Pat Hoban, although he went he went and came back. All these players, you know, have been there throughout the successful years as well. So it's um, you know, it was a phenomenal job that Stephen done, and now Vinny has has uh, has obviously kept it going. Yeah, unlike some of the others, you've only won four league titles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, um, which one is your favourite? The, the first, first one? one is Sligo. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first yeah, one is always you're going to be a favourite. Ah, yeah. Um, yeah. For, for yeah, Dundalk, yeah. which one would you say yourself for the club? Yeah, I suck it. It's, it's I probably, um, it's hard to know because like, in the first year we, we won the double in 2015 and obviously 2016, then we had won the league and went to Europe in the group stages. So like, it's hard It's hard to pick. I'd probably, when you look at it, to, uh, 2018, when Cork won it in 2017, and for us to come back then and win a double in 2018 was the extra little bit of satisfaction because of the fact that you had lost it the previous year and people would have probably been doubting the squad and doubting me personally and stuff like that. So it was nice to turn it around in 2018 and, and obviously um, to go on and win a double. You know, probably that year was, you know, of the four, I suppose, at Dundalk was probably the most enjoyable um, because we'd lost it the previous year to go and, and, and to claim it back. The amazing thing I felt you find with the group personally is the fact that they seem to keep up a level of hunger and consistency and people underestimate that sometimes. It's not just all about putting 11 individual players on the football pitch, as you know. Um, how, how does that happen? How do you keep up that hunger? Because I've seen other teams win league titles, very good teams. And that's it. You know what I mean? It's one title and that's it. How do you do it? How do you manage it? How does the group manage it? And, and it is the group. It, like, mm-hmm. It's not an individual. I think, you know, you've got you've got a really good group of players and, and individually and collectively there's that drive and hunger and desire to do well. And I think, I suppose, you look at it, it's, it's what you want to achieve in your career. Do you know, do you want to be remembered as, as somebody who won one league or do you want to be a multiple champion? And I think lads in our group, you know, have had that taste of success and, and Stephen demands so much of you, and we've been able to build on on that. Um, obviously, the key's been able to, I suppose, steer that drive and the hunger and the individually into a collective, and, and you know that has been maintained. Obviously, with with Vinny coming in and keeping that continuity, because Vinny had been there obviously throughout with Stephen and, and knows the players and knows the group, and and no matter what player comes into the group, you know they see how hard everyone works there, and then and that's what's expected of. Them. Of any new player coming in so you know the continuity that has been in the squad has obviously helped you know for the i suppose the hunger and the drive within the group and, and you know because you've had that core group of maybe eight or nine players that have been there through through most of the success or all of the success and um, it, it's been good in, the, in that regard you know as yeah, so you say you have the seven or eight nine whatever core players there but then when you add two or three maybe every season that are pushing them as well i suppose that really helps in that sense as well doesn't it that you can get the right yeah. players in and you seem to have done that like even with players that might have had a tougher first season by the second season they're looking good like you know yeah it, it's been it's often been the case where you see players coming in the first season and it's kind of it's about bedding into the group and, and you know and and i suppose it might be to getting up to the standard whether it be you know there's obviously certain things that maybe they weren't as strong at and you know there's extra demands of them in our club and um, you know you see players really kick on the second third year and stuff like that and it can be kind of overwhelming to come in and, and see the level that you know lads are training at and the level that lads are working at and the extra work that players will be doing 
and you know that's obviously you know it depends on where you're coming from or what you've been doing beforehand but it's um you know lads then become you talk about the, the drive and the hunger that's you know in order to get the place in the team they know that they're going to have to outwork the man that they're looking at or has been there before so there's obviously that the, that drive and that pressure on you to kind of go and perform and go and work as hard as you possibly can to try and get in the team and then when you're in the team you have to maintain it and, and, and that's just as hard so um there is like there's great camaraderie in the team and it's a fantastic group and, and there's great people in the squad and, and that's been core to the that's been core to all the success that we've had do you find some players sometimes they come in and maybe don't think they think the league is a little weaker than they first thought do you think there's an element to that in general in the league sometimes with new players that come in yeah, I don't know about new players coming into the group. I think you know, there's probably an element in it. I think you know people probably underestimate our league in general, and certainly people who are not familiar with it. And and then you know they might get an eye opener when when you see. I suppose European football is where people really stand up and pay attention for say the the, the wider uh, community looking in at, at League of Ireland and see teams like ourselves or Shamrock Rovers performing well in Europe against you know teams that would be household names. And um, that that really kind of shows that the level that our players are at. Um, I don't think there's huge gaps. Like you know, you look at you know, some of the teams that we would have played against in the group stages and, and you know in qualifiers over the last number of years. There wasn't any games where you said, well, we were completely outplayed. Um, like and and that's kind of testament to the to, to the work that has gone in, whether it be physically and mentally with players, you know, to get up to a certain level and and to go and achieve. Um, stuff in Europe and, and that's like I said that's where, where our league is probably judged on you know Which European game would be your favourite do you reckon I know from my point of view the win against Bate was a great result to beat them 3-0 at home these have been in the Champions League group stages they played the likes of Rome and teams like that you know what I mean I think they've beaten Rome actually have they but anyway which games would you say were your favourite in Europe um, I always enjoy the away games and the atmosphere in the away games um, and, and like that battle game, I think it's everyone's favourite because of what we achieved. But the away leg in Legia, in terms of atmosphere, was probably the best atmosphere I've ever played in. Um, the place was absolutely jammed, and, and like it's the biggest game that I would have played on in my career. In terms of it's it's the game to get into the Champions League group stages proper. And we're one nil up away in Poland, and. They're after getting a man sent sent off, and we've got a real opportunity of you know of getting there, you know, and, and that kind of go a lot of the time is forgotten about because they got an equaliser pushing on, but we, we were a kick of a ball away from taking it to extra time to go to go to uh, the group stages of the Champions League, like, and that was certainly in terms of atmosphere, is the biggest game I would have played in my career. And the atmosphere there was absolutely unbelievable. It's hard to describe. I think, you know, the roar when it came out to do me warm, there was only about 10,000 people there. But there's a guy behind my goal in the first half and he doesn't even look at the game. He's facing the fans and he's on a drum and he's beating away and he's calling all the all the shots in terms of what they're singing and all the rest. But they were they, unbelievably loud. But it, it, like, it wouldn't be one that you'd be in awe. It, it was great to be able to play in that atmosphere. And that's what you that's what you dream of playing in, in that sort of atmosphere. And that's my favourite game. Um, look, we, we drew one all. We, we, we probably could have, if it was the case, if it had been the first leg, we probably would have won 1-0 because we would have, you know, we, weren't, we wouldn't have been looking for a winner in, or a second goal in the 92nd minute and got caught. But it, it was uh, fantastic. It was great to get into the Europa League anyway. I know the Champions League just would have been unreal, wouldn't it? But um, I think you played Zenit in a couple of games, didn't you, in the Europa League? Yeah, we played Zenit. Uh, we yeah. played Maccabi, yeah. Maccabi uh, Tel Aviv. We beat them in, yeah. in Tala 1-0. And yeah. we, we drew one all away in, in Alkmaar in the first game. Yeah, I think the performance at home, I think it was to Zenit. I think you were beaten maybe 2-1, is that right? Um, yeah. I remember, but that was a good performance, wasn't it? You could have easily got something out of that game, actually. Yeah, we went one nil up. I actually didn't play in that game. We went one nil up, and um, they they got, they got two goals late on in it. Um, yeah. But but even the Maccabi game is the one where we beat them one nil, and we were very comfortable for the whole game. It was the second game of of, of the the group stages, and you know to go and you know to play, I suppose, a well established uh, European team, and to be so comfortable and to win the game. Like I remember that game. Like 
they didn't even have many chances. It was kind of it was we were so it was such a composed performance and um we really snuffed out their danger man and they had some really good players in that team. And uh, I think um I can't remember now one of the guys from Liverpool was play came on that time. Ben Ayun came on as well. So that's the sort of quality that they had on the bench. Um so but the performance we put in that day to go and win like Make history and win the game in in uh, in the group stages. So it, we were obviously the first to get a point in the previous round, and then to go and get the win in the next round. And we were looking good for qualifications for the next the next rounds. You know. Yeah, well, that's the amazing thing though about Stephen's teams as well. No matter what the opposition, he sets you up it's similar enough. Like you try and play football, don't you? And that's a that's I suppose the thing that Stephen tries to do with his teams, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I know as well as that. Like, sorry. Regardless, regardless of the opposition, so even if it's Zenit St. Petersburg or whoever, like there's no, we're going to sit back here and look for a draw attitude, isn't there not? Yeah, no, there's certainly not. And I think, you know, that would have been the kind of way you would have, what you would have associated with League of Ireland teams in Europe in the past would be scraping a 1 0 and back to the wall for, you know, grabbing a goal and then back to the wall for the last half an hour, whatever it may be. But that certainly wasn't the case. It's about going out there and being true to, to I suppose, his beliefs and the team's beliefs and, and, and trying to play the game. The way we want, and and you know, you look at the te- the players and the personnel that we would have had, and and we were, you probably wouldn't see it in a league game because we would generally dominate possession, but we were very good counter attacking players, the likes of McMillan and Horgan and McElhenney and stuff like that. We're real quality, um, you know, so we're obviously very dangerous. Like we could sit in, but we could we could keep the ball and retain the ball quite well. It wouldn't be a case of you know kicking the ball away, it'd be, you know, retain the ball quite well and, and taking this thing out of it. And you have to be able to do that in Europe. And, you know, that's why Joseph and Doe say when was a Sligo was great in Europe because you, you know you could trust Joey and give him the ball no matter where you, he'd want the ball. And you need lads that are comfortable on the ball in, in European games. And we had that in the likes of Stevie O'Donnell as well. Brilliant in there controlling games and, and Chris Shields. So we we like we had real quality all over the all over the place and, and we were um, lads were comfortable to go and play. And Stephen gave him that confidence and that belief to go out and do that as well. And that that's been key. Now you've been in the Irish squad twice. Um, are you expecting a call from Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> I might get a call from him, but I don't know if we go <laughs> play goals. <laughs> <laughs> and what's that experience so far? You've been called up to the Irish squad twice. I think once was under Martin O'Neill, wasn't it? And the other one? Yeah, no, they were, they were both, both under uh, both under Martin O'Neill. I came in for um, uh, the game against the Netherlands before the Euros, and then he brought me back in for um, the Oman game and the Serbia game, which is a World Cup qualifier a- after the Euros. So it was kind of it, it was great because like, you were. You know, you you were in for the the friendlies before the four lads went away and played well and, and did well in the Euros and then come back in afterwards. So it was good that um, I went in and did well and that you know I I impressed enough to be brought back in a second time. So that was that was hugely I suppose positive and it gives you great belief. You know that you can go in there and hold your own with Premier League goalkeepers and Premier League players. So it just goes to show the fine margins and the and the breaks that you you need to get. And you know there's loads of players, quality players in our league. You know that have that ability to go and play, you know, at higher levels. You only look at like I would have played with Andy Stevens in, in at St Pat's and stuff like that. And you know he's a household name now and probably one of the best fullbacks in in the country. And came from our league. The same with James Coleman. And there's there's loads of players that have been developed in our league and have gone away and, and have had terrific careers. So I think sometimes we can underestimate our players and and you know and probably not give them the credit that that they deserve. And they're more than capable of of you know obviously getting into international teams. But also playing international football and, and, and performing at, at a really good standard. Hundred percent. How do you see Stephen doing the job himself? Have Have you seen any of the games, any under twenty one games or anything like that that he's taken? I, I've I've seen I have seen I haven't actually been that live game. I've, I've yeah, seen bits yeah. and pieces on TV. I look. I I think Stephen will do a terrific job. Um, like I know that he'll give absolutely everything. Uh, to it and you, the level of detail that he will go into in in terms of scouting players and bringing players in and developing a squad and a style of play, um, I I just I, I would have absolutely no hesitation in saying that I think he'll do a terrific job and uh, you know obviously we we'll, we'll all be wishing him well and and hoping that that will be the case but I think it, it's a case of, of building a team for the future as well and I think the FEI will give him time to do that. You can see the job he's done with the under twenty ones in a short space of time, and you know that group is developing and, and will become you know senior internationals, I suppose, in the near future. And you know if you give Stephen time with them in, in order to grow, to grow a team and build a team, um, I think he'll do a brilliant job. 
yeah, I think if we want to develop a new kind of philosophy or style that we haven't seen, maybe in the seniors for quite some time, we do see it at underage. Um, any manager, be it Stephen, anyone else, definitely needs the time to develop that, don't they? Because um, I suppose you can't complain about, you know, sitting back against teams and then for attacking and, you know what I mean, that style of football Stephen likes to play and then complain if you lose one or two games. There's definitely, there'll need to be patience, won't there? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I th- and I think there will be. I think you've got to give them two to six years to kind of develop. You know, you look at the, you look at all the underage teams and the success under uh, Tolly O'Brien and Tom Moan and these guys, and and obviously Stephen in the twenty one. So there is really good players coming through, and and that's down to the, you know, the the pathway and the coach education that's there, and and the, the our underage coaches have been doing terrific jobs with, with young players and. And you know, and developing, and and you can look at the success of, of the underage teams in recent years and how they're getting on. So that that work will come to fruition in the next few years. So I think Stephen, you know, is taking it on a really good time, and he's obviously been able to cut his teeth at under twenty one level and, and build relationships with these players. So they them players will now come into senior squads and have a relationship with the manager, and that can only benefit uh, the squad and the team. Yeah, I think actually it's worked out very well to be honest with you. Um, so basically, where are we at now? Yeah, the best player you played against, Gary. Um, I know. I, I think like probably Wayne Rooney. Do you know? Uh, when did you play against, against Wayne? I'm trying to think. You know, in 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 the Aviva in the first game, um, the first game in the Aviva Stadium, he played for Man United. You know, he wasn't too hot that day, but he, he's gone on yeah. to have quite a good career. Yeah, 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 he has, hasn't he? Uh, best player you played with? Um, I think it's a tough one. one. Yeah, it is. A, it's a tough one. Um, probably, probably Joseph and Doe. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I have to think about it. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't ag- doesn't aggravate too many of my teammates. There's obviously been plenty of them that are very good, you know. But See, you're Joseph clever there. Probably, yeah, clever yeah there, no, t- very very tactical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you retire, do you hope to get into coaching, Gary, or what's your plan, or do you know really, or is management a thing even you'd like to do, or what do you think yourself? I, I actually don't see myself going into management. Um, yeah. It's hard to know. I'm looking outside of the box. I'm not kind of, you know, pigeonholing myself into coaching when I'm finished. Like, I've, like I said, I've done a sports management degree. I'm um, hoping to use that. Um, like, you just never know. I don't want to have to rely on coaching after I finish playing because I'm after me kicking balls for 20 odd years. And if I get injured, I can't kick balls. I can't coach, so I can't work. So I think it's it's best to look at, at stuff outside of football. It might, might obviously be, you know, be football orientated, but I'd be more looking at you know at off the field stuff rather than you know goalkeeping coaching specifically. Obviously, I'd like to stay um, say coach in some capacity, but I don't want it to be uh, completely dependent on coaching when I do finish up. So it, I am looking at other avenues first rather than like uh, something that I know I can do. I know I can probably coach afterwards to some degree, and it just depends on how much time or you want to put into that. But um, is there is a is it is there stability in that after twenty years playing League of Ireland, which wouldn't be the most stable environment? Um, so I just don't know. But I look, I'm hoping to continue playing for a little while yes. And um, obviously, I'm really enjoying my football. And you, look, you can't go back. Like when you're finished, you're finished. So look, part of the reason why I did step down from the PFAI is because I, I wanted to kind of focus completely on my football and, and give it everything I've got while I'm still playing. And and I think I need that focus just to kind of you know, to, you know, I suppose, make the most of my career because, like, like I say, you know, you can't have it back. You know, you've, you've, got, to, you've got to give everything you've got when you're, when you're playing and I tend to try and get every, every drop out of it and, and, but I want to play to the best of my ability till the end. So that's, you know, that's, that's most important, I think. And if you don't do that, like, I, I won't be playing. So that's just the way it is. There's no point retiring, though, for the sake of retiring either, sure, isn't there, in fairness? Not really. Look, I, as long as I'm playing... I, think I, I want to, like I want to be kind of I want, like at this stage in your career you want to be playing like I've been lucky enough to play f- lots of football all the way through and I think um, the most important thing is to be playing football like um, that 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 for me and that's what kind of keeps me going that and that's why you do the training the extra training to keep keep going and try and I suppose maintain your levels and and like to be maintain that Dundalk is 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 difficult at the best of times. So like that's where I want to I want to kind of you know continue and keep them standards and and and, and obviously look play as play as long as you can. Well we'll just finish up with a few teammate questions, Gary. So uh, who's the most skillful <laughs> lad in trade? Now I'm interested in this because I Pat Huben a few weeks ago 
So I'm going to be right. interested to see how they match up, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, so most skillful lad at, at Dundalk. Uh, Nathan. Yeah. You sign him. Yeah, he had him. Yeah, he went for him as well, but he, he went for Patrick actually. Patrick McIlhenny. Well, look, you can go for e- you could go for either. Yeah. I'd like I'd like to see that match up. He threw him in as well. He said keep an eye on him. So probably uh, because I'm so used to seeing Patrick at this stage because like, he's unbelievable quality. But like Nathan at the minute, he just looks looks top notch. Like. That's great for Dundalk. They, they love that sort of will because we haven't seen him yet really. So uh, biggest joker in the group. Um. Uh, uh, Shieldsy would be the, the, the funniest man in the group. He'd be up there with Sean Gannon because Gannon was a great man with the one liners. He could cut you down with one line. Uh, but Shieldsy is a great character. Shieldsy is the, the funniest man in the group. Hardest trainer? Uh, so many of them. Uh, hard, very, very difficult. I'd say you know, uh, probably Brian Gartland. I think you got to mention as well, but who, as Patrick was saying as well, like it's such a driven group on that that everyone, I'd imagine, trains it's, extremely hard. Yeah, it's it, it, like you know, it, it's nearly like it's the standard. You've got to train hard, um, and I think you know, there's not many who don't. To be honest with you, couldn't be successful if they didn't. Uh, the yeah. moniest member of the squad, uh, Pat Hoover. <laughs> probably, Pat, Pat probably gave that to himself. He did. Did he? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I knew it, I don't know, I just said to him, that kind of face, I just knew <laughs> You knew it, him. Uh, Yeah, yeah, who's the hard man? Um, the hard man? Not Sean Gannon, anyway. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, difficult. Say Boiler, Boiler's tough now. Yeah, I, th- I think Pat had himself up there, and I think he might say Sean Hoare, if I remember rightly. Um, most vain can't get out of the mirror <laughs> I think Massey always gets this when he get, and it's harsh on him <laughs> Massey always gets it out of this one it's just the hair he goes bananas if he touches his hair serious yeah he's not losing any of it yet he, he's lucky to have it he's a, little, yeah. a few sprinkles of grey in it but he's not losing it it's a strong looking barnet in fairness <laughs> Great, that's good stuff, Gary. Look, Gary, pleasure having you on. Uh, I know you're a busy man, so thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. No problem at all. Chat to you guys.